Awo, Shalom Rastafari. Greetings, this is the 24th uh, sabbatical um, reading and feeding in our Torah portion, um, known as Vayikra. Vayikra. Let's move this over here. Vayikra. And Vayikra refers to um, the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus. Um, the Hebrew book of Leviticus, the third book, the third of our Torah portions, readings, and feedings as black Jews, as Beta Israel, we who are in the diaspora in the in the West. Some say since fifteen thirty, um, some say fourteen ninety two. If we add the four hundred years, we'll have a a correlation with the Ethiopic revelation of Rastafari, 1530 equals 1930, uh, 1492 equals 1892 in the birth of the Son of Man or Lij Tefari. Now, this book known as um, Vayikra or the Hebrew book of uh, Leviticus, this book here, let's uh, uh, put that down right there. And now, Vayikra, let's go through a little bit of um, some of the basics on this. Let's bring this up right here. And now, Ethiopically, Ethiopically speaking, let's go to the Mastawisha. We know this as Orit Ze Le Wawiyan. And as an acronym, we call it the OZL. The O Z, the O Z, of course, that's Oz right there. But it's also um, some say wisdom, wisdom of Oz, so forth and so on. But we're coming from an Ethiopic, from the East, looking at it from the East, the true luminary, the true master that sits in the East, the King of Kings and His Christ. Now, the O Z L, that's our acronym for Orit, which is Ethiopically speaking, Torah, Z. Ethiopically speaking means of and Lewawian, it refers to the Levites, the Levites. Now, in the in the Masoretic or the traditional what's known as the traditional uh Hebrew Bible is called Vayikra. Vayikra, um Va or We We Yikra 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 and he called, and he called. It's the Hebrew first word of this particular portion, or kufal, parsha in the Hebrew. The 24th in our weekly Torah, or orit, portions in the annual Hebraic, or our black Jewish, or Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew cycle of Torah readings that we know in the Royal Amharic and the Ethiopic as the orit, Nibab or the Orit Minbab, the Torah readings. And it's the first book, or it's the first, actually, this is the first portion of the first reading in the book of Leviticus, which is the third portion of the Torah or the Pentateuch, the five books of our Coptic, Hebraic, Ethiopic brother Musa or Moses. Now, this particular portion, the 24th, it constitutes Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1, to Leviticus chapter 5, verse 26. Now, we as black Jews and Hebrews and elect Rastafari, who are in the diaspora, the Ethiopian Hebrews in the diaspora, the diaspora, we read it in the 23rd or 24th Sabbath, or Senbet, after the Simchat Torah, the Simchat Torah, which means the joy of Jah's law, or the joy, the Simchat of the Torah, and Torah, or Rit, is the law of Jah Adonai. Now, generally, this is read in March, or early April. Now, this particular parasha, or this particular portion, it lays out the laws 
of the sacrifices, what's known as the sacrifices. In the Hebrew, it's known as the korbanot, or the korbanot in older Hebrew. Modern, revised Hebrew calls it the korbanot. And this is like the korban. The word korban is an Afro-Shemitic word. Korban, the sacrament. The sacraments, the korbanot, bamarinya it would be. In the Hebrew, it's the korbanot, which means the plural of the sacrifice. Now, let's get into this particular reading and feeding. And so we took a couple of days to really kind of like meditate, meditate more on this particular portion. This is why this hopefully will probably be uploaded roughly on the Monday, this part, this portion. We had other um, other lectures and reasonings to um, present forward. And what's interesting is that the Holy Spirit has guided I and I, and some who are sensitive to this and have picked up will begin to see how all this begins in the studies, begin to really all connect together from Old Testament to New Testament to what's going on now, to what occurred thousands of years ago. And we'll see the wisdom the wisdom, how how Yah Adoni says that the Torah is our wisdom. Now, let's bring this down right here, Vayikra. Now, what we have right here is a, a, a kind of a sample. Maybe we could call it even a demonstration, a sample of the five different kinds of of sacrifices. Now, let's get an overview of the book of, um, the third book of Moses, that's known as and called Leviticus. Now, Leviticus, and I'm going to be reading from the Schofield Study Bible right here. Now, I think this is very important to um, kind of demonstrate Old Testament, and you see the Old Testament is where we have the bullock, the ox, Secondly, the sheep, the lamb or ram. Thirdly, the goat. And then fourthly, like the turtle dove. And then fifthly, the pigeon or the kind of bird. Those those creatures, um, the, the fowl or the flying creatures. Now, Leviticus or Orit Ze Lewawian, the OZL in the Hebrew, Wayikra, uh, Wayikra, and he called. This book stands in the same relation to Exodus that the epistles, the epistles, which um, are known as, you know, the epistles after the Gospels in the New Testament. So this book stands in the same relation, relation to Exodus that the epistles do to the Gospels, that the epistles do to the Gospels. So as the epistles... Malikut, you know, they explain and they highlight and emphasize the working principles of the Wengel or the Gospels. So does this book, Leviticus, stand in that relationship to Orit Zeb, Sa'at, or in the Hebrew, Shemot. Now, Shemot, the Hebrew Shemot, the second Torah portion known as Exodus, the second book of Moses, is the record is a record of redemption redemption so when we say redemption song the real root and the core of it is based on this portion of scripture exodus but is fulfilled in christos in our our black lord and savior in the blue christos the blue christ the heavenly christ exodus is the record of redemption and it lays the foundation of the cleansing the worship and the service of a redeemed of a people who are redeemed or of a redeemed people leviticus it gives the detail of the walk, the worship, and the service of that people, of Yah's or of Jah's people. All right? So let us get a few things, a few things clarified right here. Let's bring this closer together so one can see the Old Testament types and the New Testament fulfillment. The Old Testament types 
by example or by simile, by um, uh, verb, uh, we can say the verbal hieroglyphics is the scripture right here, the pictures that they paint. And now we're seeing actual evidence, a demonstration of this clearly, um, clearly demonstrated. In Exodus, God, the true God, Ha Elohim, speaks out of the mount, Mount Sina, to which approach, the approach to Mount Sina, it was, it was forbidden, verboden, it was forbidden. Now in Leviticus, or Rit Zelewawian, he speaks out of the tabernacle. He's speaking now out of the tabernacle in which he dwells in the midst, in the midst or the heart, one can say, in the midst of his people, in the heart of his people, to tell them that which befits, to tell them that which is befitting his edisana, his holiness in their approach in their approach, in their makrab. Now, what we do, uh, uh, etymology of the word, we find that karabe, karabe, karabe. And as we go further, y'all willing, in some of the teachings and get into the language, the language is very, very important. But the karabe is, is at the root of the korban, the korban, karabe. So when we study the word korban and the korbanot, which is called the sacrifices. It links with the makreb, which means to approach. How to approach. How to approach. So when we note this, we find that Exodus, Ha Elohim, he spoke out of the mount to which approach was forbidden to all except Musa, Moses. Now in Leviticus, he speaks out of the tabernacle in which he dwells in the midst of his people to tell them that which befits his his, as you say, Rastafari, we say his islandness, Bamarinya, in the pure language of the King of Kings and his Christ, Kedisana, his holiness in their approach to and communion, their common union, the covenant, the Al Kidan, with himself, with himself. Now, the key word of Leviticus is holiness. The key word of this book the third book of Musa, known Hebraically as Vayikra, as, as Vayikra, let's see if we can bring this up again so you can see a clear demonstration right here. Vayikra, this is the, the, the Wa, actually Vayikra, 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 the Hebrew book of Leviticus. All right, so the key word here is kedisna. Key word here is holiness. It occurs at least 87 times, 87 times. And the, the key verse is said to be uh, chapter 19, verse 2. So make a note of that and check it out. Chapter 19, verse 2. Now, Leviticus is in nine chief divisions. It's in the Ennead of divisions. Firstly, we have the offerings, chapter 1 to chapter 6 and, and, and verse 7. The second part, we have the law, the law of the offerings, chapter 6, verse 8 to chapter 7, verse 38. Then thirdly, we have the consecration, chapter 8, verse 1 to chapter uh, 9, verse 24. Fourthly, we have a warning. There's a warning example. That's in chapter 10, verses 1 to verse 20. The fifth part we have is a holy God, Kedus Amlak, must have a cleansed, a cleansed people. Chapter 11 to chapter 15. The, the sixth portion is the atonement or the at one -ment. That's in chapter 16 and chapter 17. Now the seventh portion, the seventh uh, chief division of Orit Zelewawian uh, Wayikra'a 
is the relationship of gods of Jah's people. And this is in chapter 18 to chapter 22. Then the eighth portion is the feast, is the feast of Yahweh, of Yahweh. And that is in chapter 23, chapter 23. Then the ninth and the final portion of Orit Zelewawian is the instructions and warnings, the instructions and warnings. And this is chapter 24 to chapter uh, 27, chapter 27. Now that gives us an overview. That's a basic overview of this, the the third um the third book of Musa, the Hebrew book of Leviticus, the Torah portion, the third of the Torah portion, and this is what this is the book that we are currently in. Now, in order to put together some of the the um what what we reason on are the main some of the main um there's some main issues here because you have to recall that there's the golden calf incident, there's the golden calf incident. Although that that may be behind us, you know that may be behind us. This is speaking about in this portion of the Torah that we're in, it, it, it shapes the context of of why we have the the priesthood being of this particular tribe when Yahweh originally said that the that that Kol Yishroel, that all of Israel was to be a, a nation of the priesthood. But as we as we review Exodus, putting Exodus Exodus provides a context for where we are at right now. In order to overstand true Christina or true Christianity the true Christ, as we say, the black Christ, the half of the story concerning the Ethiopian Jesus, Yeshua, we have to make this connection right here. It's very important. And um, we give thanks and praise that we were a even able to see this. You know, when you have those questions in mind like, wow, that's interesting. Why does it say that there, but it says this over here? It could be just a, a writer's finesse. But no, there's much more to it than a simple writer's finesse. The scriptures is very, very, um, is very, very specific. So we as black Jews or black Hebrews, this portion is, is very, very significant to us. And we want you to stay tuned and bear with us. And if you have the, the downloadables like the Schofield Study Bible, it's very, very important. We're going to reference to that as well as to um, some of our wiki, what we call the Wikipedia compilations that we present um, here in um, this third, this third um, portion, third volume, the Vaikra. It's now available. You can check us out, www.lojsociety.org. Click on the Books tab, and you can... Um, get a copy of that or you can just go to the wikipedia and look up the keywords and find it there if you're familiar with it then it's 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 as easy to do it like that we provide this you know just having a book is very much more um important than just it being up there on the cloud somewhere all right because clouds change anyway be that as it may, we're going to get into this portion. This is some of the Eurocentric pictures right here that's actually contained in, in our volume, the first volume, which is basically given a, a modern Judaism point of view. But in our studies, we are touching on the half of the story that hasn't been told, giving a more Ethiopic view. Here we have a sacrifice of the Old Testament, a painting by uh, Peter Paul Rubens, classical European artist. Now, here's the contents right here in this particular um, 24th portion. Now, usually it's the, 20, it's the 24th this year, and we touched on this last week because of the, in, in order to get a, a 
a perfect order of readings. There's about 54, and some years are leap years, some years are non-leap years. In this particular year, you know, um, the 22nd and the 23rd um, 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 joins up, and that was last last week's reading. So some might be in, um, um, I was at Pekude, but actually we've moved forward to um, the Orit Zelewawian. All right, so hopefully you could check the older vids on that, as well as some of the footnotes in the Shemot. Um, in the Shemot, the second um, Hebrew book or the second portion of our Torah portion readings and feedings and, and find out, you know, that's just to align the calendar as it were. So now here we have a summary, right, the summary. Secondly, it is a classic rabbinic interpretation. Um, um, and then we have the commandments, the Haftarah, and some other um, very interesting information. Some of it we're able to go through in the weekly portions. We don't know whether we'll be able to go through this in this particular portion. But here we want to bring this up to here we want to bring this up to this particular point right here. Now, as we look at our footnotes, right, we look at some of the footnotes that we have here in the Schofield um, um, reference Bible, Schofield Study Bible. Let's go immediately to the footnote down down here. Let's let's uh okay, let's actually begin this off like this. Um the Samar Willem says Kadusa Hadamlak. We're gonna be reading from the Schofield Reference Bible. The the subscription speaks about a sweet savor offerings. Firstly the burnt offerings or what they may call the Holocaust. The Holocaust offering, Christ offering himself without spot to God. See the law of offerings, Leviticus chapter 6, verses 8 to 13. That's a note, but we're not going to go there just yet. So let's, let's deal with the first couple of verses leading into the first footnote um, link in, chap, in verse 3, chapter 1. So it says, And Yahweh called to Moshe, Musa, and spake to him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, If any man of you bring an offering to yod Hey wow Hey, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt, a holocaust offering, a burnt offering, of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will, in other words, of his own free will, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Yod Hey Wow Hey. Now, this is where our first footnote actually comes in right here. And, um, at the bottom page 126 in our Schofield study, our Schofield reference Bible. Here's what you're looking at right here, some of the examples of, of the offerings. Now, you have to remember that all these offerings are voluntary offerings, right? It says, God called to Moses, Wayikara, and he called to Moses, Tarto, from the tabernacle, and told him the laws of the sacrifices, Leviticus 1 and 1. So we have the burnt offering, or what's known as the Ola, the Ola, right? The burnt offering, the Ola, Allah, Ola. Could be bulls, it could be rams or male goats, it could be turtle doves or pigeons, which the priests, the, the Kahin or the Kohanim, burnt completely on the wood, on the altar. And this is what we have here in Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3 to 17. Now, we're up to verse 3 right here. In order to, let's give, let's give a word picture. I think a word picture would be in, in better order right here. So the people, right, the people, as they were somewhat used to in ancient Egypt, Right? This is a small picture right there. Let's see if we can get a larger a larger picture 
of that. Well, that's uh, an ancient Egyptian picture where ones and ones would bring forth their their offerings to the gods, to the deity, to the priests in the old version of the religion, in the old version. Now, what Moses did, Moses, in a sense, was introducing what, for lack of a better word, would be a new God. However, in proper context, what Moses was introducing, once again, was the true God, whose worship over time had gotten, had gotten defiled. Now, we're going to get into some of the details about that, hopefully going, going forward. We're just giving some, some basic notes, some basic notes of some of the basic matters here, and let's, let's uh, bring that down. So here's what we have right here. Let's also bring this down right here. All right, and here's what we have right here. We have the Mizbeach, Mizbeach, the Mizbeach which is the Hebraically speaking, right? This is the the brazen altar, right? The brazen altar. Now, in the New Testament, the epistles will explain more about this. This is what Hawari Aulos is speaking of when, when, when Paul is speaking about coming to the cross and the foot of the cross, in a sense, and we talked about this before, how when you look at the cross and you look at the the tabernacle, you know, the tabernacle, in a sense, is, is a likeness of, of Christ. And we hear a lot that Christ fulfilled the Old Testament types and, and similes, like the brazen, the brass, his feet like feet of brass, which both speak of his humanity, speaking of a black man, as well as speaking of his divinity as that particular place to come bring the offerings and to, and to humble and to bow before the black male who is Christos, Hamushia. This is very interesting. And, and, and as we begin to go through this true theological interpretation, it will explain a lot of what is wrong with the world and how the world has been deceived by the old serpent, by the devil. Now, the burnt offering, right, firstly, it typifies Christ, Christos, as you see clearly demonstrated in front of you and pictured before you. Christ offering himself without spot to Ha Elohim in delight to do his Father's will, in delight to do his Father's will, even in moat, or moot, or death. Secondly, it is atoning because of the amanya, or the faithful one, the mitmanan, has not had this delight in the will of God. That we even as ones who say, yes, I and I have faith, but have we had our delight in the will of God as Christos so clearly, so clearly demonstrates having that particular delight in fulfilling and in doing the will of God. But it's through this that we receive the grace, which is much like a pro, uh, probationary. It's like a plea bargain, in a sense, to get our spiritual heads and hearts, to get our, our acts spiritually and spirit and in truth, our acts together. So what Christ sacrifice on the cross offers the faithful as we see right here it says it says even before whose eyes why don't you obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christos hath been evidently set forth crucified crucified among you now notice something about the burnt offering and, and the symbology when Christ speaks about the baptism he speaks about the water. There's the water baptism of, of, of John, you know what I'm saying, which is the basic, the first, the initiatory, we could say, level, the bathing, the purification, that cleansing that prepares one now for the spiritual aspect. Christ is in spirit, what he has to go through in, in the baptism in spirit and, and in fire. Now, this is the fire, the crucifixion now, symbolically, 
and evidently is that fire baptism that Christ talks about that he can't say who will be at his right or left hand side, you know, when the mother of uh, John and James, the Zebedee brothers, you understand, when he brought them before, you might recall that particular scene where he speaks about the baptism that he must endure. You understand, this baptism, this is the connection of what we have right here in the footnote where it says that this is the atoning because of the amanya, which is to say the mitmanon, the one who has amen, has not had this delight in the will of ha Elohim. And thirdly, it is substitutionary. According to verse 4, the next verse coming forward where it says, and he shall put his hand upon the head, the aras, of the burnt offering, and it shall be acceptable for him to make atonement for him. So when the animals, when these these types of animals were were brought forward, right to the tabernacle, when they were brought forward to the tabernacle, and let's let's uh, bring forward a. A, a visual let's bring forward a visual this is this is one visual demonstration we sh we showed it before but let's let's bring it forward so here's here we have the mishkan or the dinquan the tabernacle now there's a change that has occurred and we'll touch on this hopefully in another portion of this lecture the change has occurred in the name right in the name of the tabernacle after the golden calf incident. This is something that we have to know. There was a change that had occurred after this golden calf incident. We find this in um, Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter, where's our note? Uh, 33 and 7. 33 and 33 and 7. We have a change occurring where it is no longer um, being called um, the tabernacle. Let's let's bring this up right here. This is another portion of our study, the book of the um, Gerald Macy's, a book of the beginnings. And let's see if we can find this portion right here. Where let's highlight this right here. Okay. Um, right. Boom, this is the highlight right down here where it says, it says, now the Jews kept or keep a fast in this month of June, July in memory, which is Abib or Aviv, Av, and or later in the month was changed to Tammuz or in Egypt, Mesore, um, in memory of the tables of law broken by Moses on Mount Sinai, the breaking of the two tablets was followed by removing the tabernacle and changing its name to the tabernacle of the congregation. So the, the tabernacle's name was changed to the tabernacle of congregation and the tabernacle was moved and afterward the two tables, the two tablets was were were renewed. Were renewed. So this is a very significant aspect right here. Let's see if we can bring this up. Um, from the actual from the actual scripture right here, thirty, thirty-three, thirty-three and seven. Let's go to thirty-three, chapter thirty-three and seven. It's this verse right here. And here, here we go right here, where it says, "Um, Musim din kwanun iye wesede kasefer wich ye teklo neber." Kasafaruma rak yadargo nebar ye megananya wuma dinquan below tara egaziavi her nima ye felega hulu kasafar which a wadalo would a megananya dinquan ye wet a nebar. Now the Targum or the English over here on the right hand side it says, and Moses took the tabernacle. Remember this is this is post golden calf incident. He took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. 
Now, remember that phrase. Make a note of that phrase if you haven't. If you already don't know where we're going with that particular phrase, without the camp, it will explain why Christos, why Christ, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, why he was crucified, as the scripture says, he was crucified without the camp. You understand? Know Outside of the gates of Jerusalem. So if you just see these things in the New Testament, without the Old Testament, you can see without the camp. You understand? Know Other pictures kind of demonstrate where you see Jerusalem, but you see the, the place Golgotha or the place of skulls was a place without or outside of the camp. So now the camp, the tabernacle, was removed after this particular golden calf incident because the people had, had, had returned to their vomit. In other words, they, instead of going forward, they had gone backward religiously, spiritually, theologically speaking. They had said that they were they, they ready to go forward with Yahweh, you know but they went backward to their former form of worship, spiritual bondage, the spiritual bondage that they were wrapped up in under the, the apostate Egyptian orders, the apostate committing orders. Now, the true order, you understand, know that existed in ancient Egypt that was Yahweh's, that recognized John Adoni, they're part of the mixed multitude that came out with the Beit Israel, the mixed multitude. It doesn't say they were Israelites. They were not Israelites. You understand? Know they were Egyptian, just like the, the Beit Israel were Egyptian in their nationality, but they're not even of the blood. Of, of, of the patriarchs, but they're of the same religion. And this is one, one place where we say Macy did a wonderful job in a book of the beginning. But unfortunately, many who have gone in and used that book, you understand, such as the New Age movement, the Eurocentric Acharya as the Zeitgeist people who refer to Macy, the Blavatsky people, the rest of them. Macy, he did not endorse Charles Macy, the, the Aryan philosophy, but an Afrocentric or a, an Ethiocentric philosophy or et Ethiocentric truth, where he said that in order to understand these things in the Bible, and to comprehend them, instead of looking to the north and, and to India and up to Europe, the Indo-European one has to go to Africa. So looking at Macy's work again and comparing it with the scripture diligently, we're beginning to see how, how, how great and how blessed the work of Gerald Macy was. Some of you all might know this already. Some might still to learn this, but we'll touch on here and there and try to give more examples of it. So, in this portion right here, let's bring this up. We have it also right here, which is a little more detail from this word program right here, where it says, where, where now you can go through each particular word for the more diligent student. You understand? You go through each particular word right here. And Moses, it gives you the Hebrew, you know, which word took the tabernacle. Now, when you're just reading it in English, you see tabernacle and tabernacle. One thing you don't recognize is the change in the word for tabernacle. Before the tabernacle, Hebraically was known as the Mishkan. Now the tabernacle is known as the Auhel, the Auhal or the Auhel, which basically means, as it says right here, a tent as clearly conspicuous from a distance. Now, that, that brackets right there is clearly conspicuous from a distance. It was kind of curious. Why does it have that there? Now, when you look at the fact that what, what did Moses do in this particular chapter right here, in this particular verse, 33 and 7, and Moses took the tabernacle, he took it, and when he took it down, he pitched it without the camp. So he dismantled it. It was in the midst of the camp, and he took it without the camp, afar off from the camp. Notice that, afar off from the camp, and then he called it, so now we have the tabernacle being renamed. Now, most would see this and probably just say, okay, it's not the tabernacle anymore. You see capital T, lowercase t, all that is, 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 is minor. You understand? What's really major is, is the word now that is being called. 
as it's being called, Ohel, as a tent. Because people are not seeing, it's not up close anymore. Now it's being pitched a far, a far way, a far way off. And it's not the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, but it uses the word congregation that more correctly when you look at the, at the um, Schofield, uh, not Schofield, but the Strong's Concordance especially, it tells this is Moed. Moed, Moed, Moled. It's Moled, Moed, or Moled, which is interesting because that has to do with a birthing chamber. Feminine sense, Moeada, Moeada, Second Chronicles 8. Now, firstly, properly it means an appointment. Bamarinya, the change is also evident as it goes from Maderia, which is the equivalent of Mishkan, a, a dwelling place, because of the dwelling, the, the Shekinah, the glory of God dwelling, to a place of meeting, in the sense of a place of an appointment. That's the key difference. You understand? The, so we have the, 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 the change in the name. Just, just keep that, that note right there, that the tabernacle after the golden calf incident, after the golden calf incident, which is a very, very interesting incident and really needs to be studied a little bit more because that's what called for this book of Exodus. I mean, called for, the, for Leviticus, should we say. This is, what, this is the real reason because I've asked myself, well, why, why would just uh, the Levites be the, the, the priests if he says at first that he wanted the whole nation of Israel? Why would that be so? Because they had already apostated themselves. See, here's you have to notice that they had already apostated themselves with the whole, the entire um, golden calf incident. And we're going to touch on that as well. But please make note of this right here. Because now the details for, for the change are all based on what happened after the, the worship of the golden calf. So it's not that he is dwelling amongst them. You know where Revelation says that he will be our God, and he will dwell amongst us, he will walk amongst us, he will be one with us. That was the offer to the day to Israel. But because they were so steeped and so disobedient, they went backward instead of forward. They went backward to the apostate form of the worship that they once knew in Egypt when they were under the spiritual bondage in that time and space. Let us understand in that time and space. Because the true worship of Jah was known in Egypt at an earlier time. But now Egypt had degenerated to that particular point in time where they had a false perversion of it, much like today we have counterfeit Christianity. You know, was that 2,000 years later, we have counterfeit Christianity. When we go to earlier periods of time, we can see true and sincere Christians, not just of the, the Jewish stock, but of, of many different nations. But more and more, everybody is coming into this mystery Babylon. Well, what, what, uh, what's occurring now was similar to what occurred then. Now, there's this remnant. You know, saying, this remnant that comes out, and the condition was that they would not apostate or turn around or go back to that old stuff. But since Moses didn't come down, you remember the incident where Moses doesn't come down for a while, and they asked Aaron um, to give us, give us the God that delivered us. So what, what Aaron and what the others had done, basically, instead of explaining the true type, they continued to explain it under the false type that the Israelites were supposed to separate themselves away from. In, in other words, it's like going back to the catechumen, you know, going back to the cartoon figures, you know, instead of dealing with the reality. So they were not, so the people, the only ones who stood fast and true were the Lewawian, were the Levites. And we're going to touch on that particular scene as, as well. Now, the thing, when we look at the, the translation here, congregation, we look at this is the, the, the Mikel, 
the Mikkelsen's um, Enhanced uh, Strong's Greek and Hebrew Dictionaries. We look at this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Now, the King James translates this word congregation. This is important to know. Sometimes it translates as appointed, a sign, or time, a place of solemn assembly. Sometimes you find it as the, the tabernacle of assembly. Sometimes as congregation. Sometimes as, as a set or a solemn feast. Sometimes as a po- appointed, like a due season a solemn season. Sometimes it's translated as synagogue or set time appointed. So this is, this is a key as well down here because this will qualify this word because what Moses does right here in Exodus 33 and 7 is the reaction for the apostasy, the going backward. You understand? You know, it's almost like it's like people recognize that Yeshua HaMoshiach, our people, the lost sheep, we recognize that he is black, right? He brings us out and they go back to the white Jesus. That, that's similar to what the Israelites had done and the mixed multitude had done in the, in the golden calf, in the golden calf incident. All right? Now, let's touch on this right here. Let's just go forward with this a little bit more, right? So when we look at the word congregation, right, we look at the word congregation, Right, we look at the word congregation right here. We see that um, the the root meaning of it properly is an appointment, a fixed time or season. See, before there was no just appointment. It wasn't by appointment. They could come any time to Yahweh's presence. After they put other gods or idols before him and went and went back to their vomit. They could only come at an appointment. They could only make an appointment at a fixed time or season, specifically at the festival season, the seven to eight festival season, conventionally a year. By implication, it's an assembly as convened for a definite purpose. They could not come whenever they wanted to. They did not have that access to his presence. It's almost like Yahweh said, since you want to, Go backward again, since you're 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 like this 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 animal sacrifice thing. I'm gonna give you the animal sacrifice thing to its full, and I'm gonna teach you through these types that obviously, in other words, it's like taking someone who should be ready to go to college and they're going back to um 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 uh, kindergarten in a sense. You know, they're going back to, you know, like, you remember the kindergarten books and stuff, or the cartoon figure, the talking monkey and pig and ape and, 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 and different animals, elephant and Mickey Mouse and stuff like that. So since you like that so much, I'm going to give you your full of it. It's similar to what Yahweh did with the food. You remember when they wanted the debtors, they wanted to eat meat? He gave them meat, but he says, under this condition, just eat enough, take enough for the day. They got greedy. You understand? They got fearful. They got disobedient. And they ate so much of this food until the food was coming out of their pores, and they got sick off of it. So who did it to them? Yahweh gave them instructions, but they went beyond the set bounds, right? So now we have Moses taking the tabernacle, you understand? And no longer so much is the tabernacle going to be called the Mishkan anymore. Mishkan is a significant word, and one of the few people that really give it its due attention according to its context out of Egypt is Gerald Macy in a book of the beginnings, um, book um, one, and particularly book two, book of the beginnings. We have that available too, a book of the beginnings, Gerald Macy. Volume two, in particular, goes into some of the more of the details that really connect this part of the story, giving us the context out of Egypt. So let's go through these words right here again. So we have the fifth one, technically the congregation. So it's the fifth meaning that's used here instead of the first meaning. So imagine if we were to add the first meaning, getting straight to the Hebrew, the Hebrew words, that and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp or far off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of an appointment, called it the tabernacle of a festival, the tabernacle of a year, the tabernacle of an assembly as convened for a definite purpose. That gives us now 
a better context, you know, saying a better context to this change that has gone on because of the apostasy, because of the the golden calf incident. Sixthly, by extension, is the place of meeting. Remember, the meeting is in context for a definite purpose. Then we have the seventh, it says, also a signal as appointed beforehand. A particular signal as appointed beforehand. So all that's very, very important. So after the incident, after now they had fallen, in a sense, out of grace, the Israelites no longer were in-laws. They had to come under laws. They were under the law. So what we have in, in the Moshiach, in our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the blue Christos, the heavenly Christ, is, is now a restoration of what was lost, a, an exact reverse of the curse, a probationary period, firstly for the, the Ihud, the Yehud, the, the Jews, you understand, the black Jews specifically, and then for the Gentiles, irrespective of race, religion, uh, or, or, or nationality, or tribe, so forth. Number first, it was for the Jews, the black Jews. Let's understand that. And then the black Jews, or the Hebrews, we were to be the light or the illumination of the nations. All right? Now, we know what happened with with that, historically speaking, you know, since we don't have to cover that, cover those trails again. So I'm giving you all of this because I think it's very important in putting Leviticus into its proper context. Because if Leviticus is not understood, why Leviticus? How do we get into Leviticus where there's a particular tribe? Mm -hmm. Where there's a particular tribe that is the representative and not the whole nation because the whole nation in the golden calf incident has shown themselves to be un to to be un um worthy if you just go to one more ver one, one more area i think is important take a note of this exodus 32 3226 let's go to exodus 3226 so let's bring up 32 chapter 32 right here and let's go to verse um, 26. Verse 26. Here we go right here, right? Now we're in chapter 32, verse 26. It says, Musain, bet al feet in di anawaru aon sid leke kwachualna hizbu sid in the Telekeku Baya Gize, and when Moses, Muse, saw that the people were naked. See, this golden calf incident was more than just some innocent, it was like an orgy, it was like some ritual, in a sense, similar to the rituals of the heathen and, and, the, and the Antichrist, even to this day, for Aaron had made them naked to their shame among their enemies. Verse 26. Verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp. It's like he stood in the stargate, you understand? And notice what happens next. And said, who is on Adoni's side? Who is on Yahweh's side? Let him, allow him, make him come to me. And all the sons of Lewi, Levi, gathered themselves together to him. So now all the sons of Levi had gathered. This is right after the golden calf incident. But what happens next? Let's just go on so you can understand the significance of this as we look at the spiritual Egypt of today, the Negroes, the lost black sheeple, 
in the spiritual Egypt of today. It says in Kut Haya Sabat Arsum, Ye Israel Amlak Gizi Avi Herendi Yilal. Ye Nante Sohulu Seifuna Bewagabulai Yitatek. Be Sefaruma Wusta Bezihna Beziya Kabur is Kabur Temalalesu Ye Nantema Sohulu Awendamun Oweda Junim Gorebe Tunim Yigdel Alacho. And he said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Thus saith the Jah Adoni. Of Israel, put every man his sword by his side. In other words, in other words, strap on your weapon and go in and out from gate to gate. Go in and out from every each of the gates, from gate to gate, throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother and every man his companion. And every man his neighbor. Wow. Now, see, some people will look at this, like the atheists and the ignoramuses, and they will say, oh, that that's must be the bad God there. Why is he doing that? Just because he had a little party? You know, people, you know, even the parties that you be going to are much more than the parties, much more than a little party, but y'all are so spiritually dead that many of you don't perceive. It's only when you begin to spiritually become awake do you really see the significance of even what the lost sheep are, are, are doing today. You understand what the lost sheep are doing today. Now, let, let us show you a little, a little demonstration right here. Let's, let's, let's see if we have this right here. Um, all right, let's see if we have this right here. Because what we found to be very, very interesting, because um, y'all, y'all remember the days of slavery, don't y'all? You know what I'm saying? Y'all remember the days of slavery? It's interesting because what we have here is the very same sacrifices still go on. It looks familiar. It should look familiar. The very same sacrifices. In fact, what's been in the media very recently is just another example of the very same sacrifices that continue to go on. When we when we speak about the, what is the law of sacrifices, you ever heard the statement, the only good Negro, the only good black man is a dead black man, the old black male is a dead black male. Some people say, oh, that's just a bunch of racism, that's bad and wrong and so forth and so on, and, and let's forget about it. But there's something deep, there's something really, really deep about that, and the scriptures properly understood that explicated, that revealed it. You see the skull and bones down here? You know what I'm saying? See the skull and bones? The place that he was crucified was called what? The place of the skull. The place of the skull. This is one of the reasons why. Um, let's see if we can bring up that other, that other right here. One of the reasons why um, we have this, we, we picture this like this right here. You see the skull and the bones right here? It's the same thing. It's the place of the skull. Where was Christ crucified? He was crucified in a place that was that was called the place of the skull. Now it's not just it's not just um accidental or coincidental that the place in which Christ was crucified is also called the place of the skull. And it's not coincidental that even in this picture we call this Negro Negro sacrifice. You understand? And the Negro still being sacrificed. Why were the Romans doing what they what they did to so many black Hebrews and black Jews? Because those Hebrews, the majority of them were black Jews that they were crucifying, even then they was lynching them. It's the same it's the same very thing. Because their sacrifice was human. You see, their sacrifice was human because before the animal sacrifice, you understand, there were human sacrifices going right to the most primordial state of human sociology, of human psychology. It's going to something very old and something very deep 
you know what I'm saying? And something now that has become like a mystery. You know how when people move on, they uh, evolve. They put behind themselves certain older forms of things. It's like they don't want to think about these things anymore. But these things are very telling. Should the uh, psychology revert? Now, in the particular incident that we have here, you understand, in Leviticus, the Levites, you understand, has slayed, I think, about 3,000. 3,000. You see what it says right here? It says that put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion, every man his his neighbor. In other words, all of those who had by commission, by actually acting in this golden calf incident or had omitted to even protest and allow this incident, there was a judgment. 3,000 were slain. Now, when we look in the New Testament, Pentecost, in Pentecost, we have 3,000 were added to the church. It's a, it's a very interesting number, but in the, in, the mystery, in the mystery of it, on the higher level of the sacred mythology of it, we can understand how it is explaining something, explaining that in the negative, what, what occurred, 3,000 died. But in the positive, 3,000 were made alive. So now it's because of this particular incident that we have here in um, Exodus chapter 32, and we go a little bit further, it says, yeah, Lewim le joch musay and dalle adaragu. Beziam kemaka hisbua shost she soach motu. And the children of Lewi, of Levi, what they did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men.